AV Solar wants to trade 4,000 acres of farmland with AVEC so that a bird can forage in perpetuity. Director Frank Donato brought an expert from Phoenix to talk about designing extraction wells, casing them and costing them. Well, my name is Jerry Lockman. Uh, I'm the lead developer for the Antelope Valley Solar Project, um, which is, as, as I mentioned, has been planned for this area. Uh, I work for SunPower. Uh, SunPower is a about a 30, uh, 25, 27 year old company. It's based out of the uh, Bay Area in uh, Northern California. The project is at an advanced stage of, uh, of development. We have uh, two power purchase agreements already signed, one for 325 megawatts, the other for 276 megawatts, getting a total of 601 megawatts. Uh, Southern California Edison is the off-taker. There's 49 megawatts have not yet been contracted, but we expect and hope that the 49 megawatts will be contracted. Uh, we have two large generator interconnection agreements, uh, each for 325 megawatts, so that makes up the, the full 650. Uh, we have control and options on uh, in excess of 4,000 acres. Uh, of land on which the project will be built. Uh, we have uh, a final environmental impact report has been approved by Cairn County as lead agency for the project. Uh, and we also have conditional use permits from both Cairn County and LA County for the project. We went to both Planning Commission and uh, Board of Supervisors in each of Cairn County and LA County for our conditional use permits. Um, project, uh, we expect to start construction beginning of next year. Project is expected to create up to about approximately 650 new construction jobs during a three year construction period. That's an average of 650 jobs per year for three years. Um, but then of course there's very little operational uh, operation required so that there will only be 15 jobs during the operations period. Uh, contracts are currently for 20 years, but we expect that it'll have a useful life of 30, 35 years. Um, so where we're at right now is we are in the planning phase. We got our, the last of our permits, the last of our major conditional use permits. Uh, we did an addendum, so that was approved in the March-April time frame. We're now in the pre-construction planning phase, and we're just about to launch our financing. This is a major transaction, major deal. It'll be about $2.5 billion deal. So we'll, we'll be seeking financing for that project in, uh, for, for that in the second half of this year. Uh, on the 1st of July, we actually formally launch our financing efforts to try and get the debt and equity we're going to need to build the project. Uh, during the permitting stage, however, we were the, the permit efficient game changed the regulations or their guidelines actually with regard to mitigation for swings and soft. So this bird here is the swings and soft. There's 14 nesting pairs of swings and soft in the Antelope Valley. So we have to deal with them as good neighbours. The project would have a, poten a potential impact on the habitat for the space as well. But it was, it was determined, based on the fish and game guidelines, that because agricultural land is perfect foraging habitat for the space as well, if we can get agricultural land within the range of foraging habitat of, of the space as well, and within five miles of an existing nest, then we just need a cons agricultural conservation easement. Now, one reason we're here talking to you is that you've got a land that qualifies, that is in, with it, in the area of the Swainson's Hawk habitat, within five miles of the nest, and is prime agricultural land. So you've got almost 3,000 acres that would qualify for our needs. Um, and then our requirement is, prior to issuance of grading or building permit, to occurs first, the project must provide written evidence for completion of one or more of the, of the farmland or Swainson's Hawk options. So farm and option is fund and purchase an agricultural conservation easement. And that easement will be managed and maintained by an appropriate entity. And that appropriate entity is that's the, at, the, at the discretion of Cairn County or LA County, depending on which mitigation measure we're trying to satisfy. Yeah, and I'm a, uh, a licensed well builder in Arizona, where I'm from, but also a hydrogeologist. I'm a, I'm a registered geologist in Arizona and California. And so what I do for a living is a, is a consultant, a groundwater consultant, but I hang out with drillers a lot, so I know a bit about well drilling. I was a uh, thing called a mud engineer in the oil industry for a while. And this is my topic today, life cycle economic analysis of water wells with considerations for design and construction. And that's real important because 
you know, it's the economy. And every and it's huge dollars. And I have an example, a, a life cycle economic analysis that I'll present. It might be a little bit different than the wells you guys deal with, but the same things apply, as I'll explain. Direct rotary um, has some advantages, and it also has disadvantages. Uh, the advantages is that the fluid we use, and I'll show you a cartoon of this in a second, it stabilizes the borehole, holds it open, keeps it from caving in, even if it's unconsolidated alluvium, and it provides good data. So we, we're, there's, there's, we're going through a sequence where we collect a lot of information while we're drilling the well. Um, it, it keeps formation problems from happening. There's a lot of formation problems that can get the drill pipe stuck and things like that. We can avoid those by controlling our drilling fluid. The disadvantages is that that fluid can cost a lot of money to get it right, get the chemistry right. We have to add uh, certain things, soda ash, um, bentonite, polymers, things like that. And the water table cannot be readily identified until we're finished. By offset wells, though, if we're not in a wildcat situation. And this is the way direct rotary works. Um, we have our drilling rig here with the drill pipe and the drill bit at the bottom. This is our borehole we're drilling. And so I'll label everything here. So we have our drill bit at the bottom. And that spins on this long, hollow drill pipe. Drill pipe comes up to a thing called a swivel. So everything below the swivel is spinning. Everything above it is not. We have a little gooseneck and a, and a hose called the Kelly hose. That allows the drill pipe to keep going down, down, down into the earth. And then a steel stamp pipe connected to a mud pump. That's just a piston pump. This kind of drilling is cost effective when we have a real large deep borehole, like the examples I'll be giving today. It's very good for data collection, as is mud rotary. And we can drill with only clear water. Now, if you go to a drilling site that has this going on, it won't look like clear water. Clear is that have quotes on it because it's really brown, dirty, but it's water. It's got very, it's got very low viscosity. We we add very little to it, not a lot of that bentonite. So its disadvantages is we need to be adding water faster than the earth can absorb water. The whole, keep the hole full. And so we may need 200 gallons per minute is a little bit extreme, but not that extreme. It's not, it's not uh, out of the question that you might need to hook up a fire hydrant and have it flown in there full blown all the time. So if you're way out in the boondocks where you have to haul water by truck, you might want to go mud water where you need less water. But if you're in an area where you have a nearby well, you can run a fire hose or a pipe to your, your new well site, you might want to have this kind of we call it reverse circulation. Remember with the other pipe, we had the uh, fluids going down and coming up the outside, the annulus. Now we have the fluids going down the annulus and coming up the inside. They're just going the opposite direction. We make that happen with this air compressor. What we do is we blow air, and it's a bigger diameter drill pipe to let this happen. We blow air, and the air, and it air lifts from here, it causes a venturi, and the, and the air blows and air lifts the fluid back up the hole. And what it does, it brings the cuttings from the drill bit with it. So the cuttings come up, go into this pit, and by gravity, this flows back down to replace the hole. We have a, this fire hose flowing into this pit right here, and we just keep adding water as fast as we can, faster than this hole can absorb it. So we have construction water out here, but it's just water. It's not mud, okay? Okay, so here we are at 166 feet, and you see a little bit of of crust, not too much yet, but we'll go a little bit deeper and get below the water table. Now we're down here at 417 feet. And you see these bumps. These are what are called tubercles. They're the little homes that the bacteria built. This is blank. So anywhere it's blank like this, this is a low carbon steel. And you can just see the amount of scale growth on here. So we'll jump down just a bit further. Now we're in a stainless steel. You see not quite as much of the growth. But now we go back in the blank. There's the change. So uh, when we're, anytime we're in uh, stainless steel, go up a little bit. There is the stainless steel. This is 500 feet right there? We're 495 feet. If you look where the pointer is right here, you see a little bit of gunk on this, but not terribly bad. But when we get to where we go into the low carbon steel, the, the difference in scale accumulation is substantial. This well was drilled in 1955, 